All right, welcome back to session two in the book study, Sinai to Zion. In the first session, we really just did an introduction. We introduced the need throughout the church today to recover this cry, the Maranatha cry of the early church, to recover a biblical focus on the centrality of the return of Jesus. Now, what we're going to do as we step into this next session is we're really going to look at not just the covenant that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai, but really the totality of the Exodus itself. The entire story of the Exodus, again, which culminates at Mount Sinai with God making covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai, the entire story is intended to be understood. It's intended purposefully by the Lord. It was painted to be understood as a betrothal or a marriage ceremony. Okay, and really understanding this storyline, it's central, it's foundational to understanding the, the story of the return of Jesus in so many ways. In the same way that the book of Exodus and Numbers, of course, recounts the story of the first Exodus, the Lord's literal Exodus of Israel from Egypt, in a similar fashion, the Bible tells the story of a second and ultimate or a greater Exodus, which is the return of Jesus. The return of Jesus and the day of the Lord not just in the New Testament, but the story is actually told throughout the Bible. It is intended to be understood as the ultimate final exodus of which the historical, the first exodus, was a mere dress rehearsal. It was a mere foreshadow. It was a prophetic type of the ultimate redemption that's to come. And so, for example, I mean, this is just sort of some very simple imagery that we can look at. The God who came down on Mount Sinai in a thick, thick cloud, a thick storm cloud, in blazing fire, with the increasing blasting of the trumpets and the whole mountain shakes, a mighty earthquake. The God who came down before the people, he is coming back in the thick storm clouds, in blazing fire, before all the people, in the sight of all the tribes of the earth, with the blasting of trumpets and a mighty earthquake. And so that's just a real simple introductory way to highlight how the imagery and the story of the Exodus, again, is carried on in the story of the return of Jesus. Now, for most Christians, the covenant, the Sinaitic covenant or the Mosaic covenant, it's largely viewed in the evangelical world, it's largely framed in a very negative light. Now, on one hand, you sort of have the, I'll say, the Hebrew roots folks, you know, within the body of Messiah, you've got, within the body of Christ, you've got the Hebrew roots folks that believe that Torah is mandatory for everyone, everyone needs to keep Sabbath and eat kosher and, you know, all of these things, right? And then on the other side, you have sort of the, I'm going to say the more classic evangelical position, which is to largely view the covenant at Sinai in kind of a negative light. They're going to largely just cite Paul, some of the things that he said that seem to be kind of negative, and they're going to have a very negative view. Now, I'm somewhere in the middle, okay? I don't believe that Torah is mandatory for all Gentiles today. I don't believe that a Christian is in sin if they don't eat kosher or this type of thing. On the other hand, I also reject the view that's, again, common within evangelicalism that says that the covenant itself is sort of bad. It's passing away, it's inferior, and all these things. Now, there are statements in the New Testament that we do need to understand in order to understand the covenant in its proper priority, in its proper place. But here's the thing, is the Torah should be seen by followers of Jesus as something beautiful as something very positive. It's intended to be framed as a thing of beauty. This was a marriage covenant that God made with Israel. He frames himself as the husband, as the bridegroom, and he frames Israel as his bride. And understanding this storyline is so critical in so many ways. For Christians, we need to have, one, a proper understanding of Torah, of its role within the story of redemption. We also need to have a proper understanding of Israel. In fact, I would say this, that the rapid, in our day, in the body of Christ, the rapid spread of a misunderstanding concerning Israel, oftentimes even anti-Semitism, a very negative, hateful view of Israel, of the land of Israel, of the people of Israel, this is a disease that is spreading throughout the body of Christ. And if there is one issue that the body of Christ needs clarity on, theological, geopolitical clarity on, is the issue of Israel, particularly as we approach the last days. 
Getting this right is, is a matter of paramount critical importance. Hey folks, sorry for the interruption. I just wanna make sure you know that we are hosting a Maranatha End Times Summit in Dallas, Texas this July, July 13th, 14th, and 15th. And you can head to maranathasummit.com to get your tickets and join us there. We hope to see you. Um, you know, and people may say, why? Look, this is essentially a chance to, for the church to live through the years of the Holocaust again, except with much higher stakes. How we respond to the coming difficulties in the days ahead will largely affect the way that we'll actually be judged on the Day of Judgment. Jesus places the judgment of the nations as a central factor in terms of how they related and how they treated Israel during the final seven years of this present age. So that's very critical. One, we want to understand Torah rightly, we want to understand Israel rightly, and three, we want to understand the story rightly. We want to understand the story of the return of Jesus rightly. And so first and foremost, we need to see the whole story as a story, a love story. You know, as it says in uh, 1 John, right, God is love. And so we shouldn't be surprised to see that when he's making covenant, when he's making promise, promises to Israel, it's a love story. And so from the very beginning of the story, the Lord is essentially pursuing Israel. We'll put it this way. He, it, it's sort of the beginning of the story is the, um, yeah, you could say the proposal. Of course, things are a little bit different because in ancient times you had betrothal and then you had marriage, whereas we in modern times have engagement and then uh, marriage. But really, at the very onset, as the Lord is preparing to court Israel, as he's preparing to enter into the sort of introductory relationship with Israel, he makes his intentions absolutely clear. And this is so important. I mean, as a father of four daughters, now I've had a few of my daughters, I've had different boyfriends, and I always look for a guy who's very clear in stating his intentions from the beginning. He doesn't try to sort of weasel his way in and develop a relationship, and what is it, what is it not, who knows, you know, he's very clear. I'm interested, like I've had guys say, I'm interested in you, I want to be very clear romantically, like can I take you out? There's no questions, there's no, the woman's not wondering like, what, what, what what's this about? and this type of thing. And I've always appreciated when a guy is very direct, uh, courageous, you know, and sort of upfront. So Exodus 6, 6 through 7, the Lord says to Moses, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. So he made it very clear. I'm going to bring you out from this toxic relationship with these false gods and this sort of slave relationship, of course and I will deliver you from their bondage. So I'm going to deliver you from slavery and from the false idols of Egypt. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and great judgment. So the Lord's going to demonstrate his power. We're going to touch on that in the next session. He says, then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. Now, let me just say this. The metaphor of marriage that the Lord intends to use with the story of this covenant. He intends to use the metaphor of a husband and wife. It is only a metaphor. It's not literal. The Lord is not literally marrying Israel. He's not literally a husband. He chooses to use terms within these metaphors that communicate intimacy. And so the Lord, throughout the scriptures, he uses the metaphor of father and children, right? Again, an analogy of intimacy. But the ultimate real picture is this. God says, I will be your God, you will be my people. That's reality. Everything else is just a metaphor, and ultimately metaphors always break down. And this is so important because people will be like, well, how do I understand this metaphor? How can we be Jesus' brothers and sisters but also be his bride? That's weird. And you go, look, don't take the analogies or the metaphors beyond what they're intended to be taken as. They're intended to communicate intimacy, but the reality is God says, I will be your God, you will be my people. I will take you to be my special people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Now, this term, take, um, lachach in Hebrew, it's a very common term used throughout the scriptures, and it entails the idea of taking a bride for oneself, taking someone in marriage. Exodus 6 through 7, I will take you to be my people. Um, Genesis 11, 29, Abram and Nahor took, again, Lachak, they took wives for themselves. Genesis 21, verse 21, Hagar, um, Ishmael's mother Hagar took for him a wife from the land of Egypt. 
Genesis 24, 67, Isaac took Rebekah, she became his wife. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan. Genesis 36, verse 2, on and on and on, multiple examples. The term most often has the connotations of taking a bride. So the Lord says, I will take you to be my own. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the teaching. If you don't already know it, let me tell you once again that the basis of our existence is Romans 15, 20, where Paul makes it clear that his driving force for mission in the world was to lay foundations for the gospel where there were none and to preach the gospel to those who'd never heard the name of Jesus. And if you would like to join us in that effort or find out more information about how you can connect with us in our pioneering initiatives in the 1040 window amongst people where there are no foundations, you can go to faistudios.org to find more information. Back to the teaching. He was essentially offering, it's not quite the proposal, but he's saying, if you'll obey me, if you'll listen to me, if you'll enter into this relationship with me. And later he says that all the nations are mine, they all belong to me, but you alone will be my special one. So this is the introduction. The Lord makes his intentions very clear. It's the beginning of the courtship. And in the next session, we'll see how the Lord uh, essentially flaunted and strutted his stuff, demonstrated his power compared to all the other gods of the earth. So amen and amen. Um, look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, God bless and Maranatha.